Hello and welcome to another Daniel and Revelation Talks. Today we are working our way through Revelation and now today we're going to get started on those seals. Last time we talked about the Book of Destiny and that was a, a little different of an interpretation than what we have seen historically in Seventh-day Adventism, but we challenge all of those as we did in the last section to to base their beliefs on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy alone, which is what our studied aim is to do here in this series. And for that reason, we can't quote people like Haskell and James White and Uriah Smith in an authoritative manner, and we won't. Uh, so today we're going to take a look at seals. It's probably not a way that if you're a Seventh-day Adventist uh, and have been for a long time, it's probably not going to be, it sounds similar to what you've heard in the past. And if you're, you're brand new to the faith and you're just learning this for the first time, it's going to be a very interesting study nonetheless. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we, we want your truth. Amen. We just want your truth. We don't want men's truth, men's tradition, men's take, men's interpretations. We beg and plead, Lord, for that I salve today. Yes. To be able to discern what messages, what, what, what warnings that you have for us in the seals, what you're trying to speak to us, Lord, yes. and tell us, because we want to learn of you. Amen. So for that reason, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here with us today, that yes. he would touch our lips with a coal from off of the altar, Amen. that he would guide our minds and our hearts to your truth, and that that would shine forth among everything else amen. today. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this one, instead of reading the whole chapter, I figured we could break it down into the, uh, the first four horsemen, uh, take a look at that, and then look at the other section from there. Sounds great, Cody. Okay, so <coughs> starting off in Revelation chapter 6, and it's going to go through all the way through verse 8, and it's going to talk about those four horsemen that uh, everybody always hears about and their riders. It says, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts sang, or four creatures, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and they that should kill one another, and there, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So Pastor Hughes, can you start to summarize these sections here and what God is trying to tell us? Cody, the, um, I want to read the statement again that we read last time. Okay. Uh, from 12th Manuscript Release 296-297. Uh, it says, Revelation 5, 1 to 3 quoted, in symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. The destiny of every nation was contained in that book. So the contents 
of the book that has these seven seals. It's a book of destiny and it has the name of every individual from every nation from the days of Adam and Eve down to the close of time. So therefore it's not confined to what we've typically been taught in Seventh-day Adventism, which is that it's, it's, a, it's a sister chapter to the messages to the churches, which would confine it to a, a, a much smaller time period, which would be about AD 31, AD, AD 34, depending on where you want to start it there, down through to the close of Earth's history. This would go back much further, even to pre-flood times, all the way back to Adam. Absolutely, Cody. That, the very statement of Ellen White, if, if the book contains the destiny of every person from the beginning of Earth's history till now, well then, Cody, the seals, their, their span, it's throughout the history of humanity. Just as you just said, it can't be confined from 31 AD down to now as the seven churches are. It can't be. Because the book of destiny spans through all time. Therefore, the seals that testify, that witness to the decisions in that book, the seals must span through all time. They Other, have to. Right. Otherwise, those seals wouldn't be related to the book in which they are sealed over, which would make no sense. It, it would make no sense at all. And as we learned last time, a Roman testament, a Roman will, they were always sealed with seven seals. And each seal was a witness saying everything in that book is absolutely correct. So, Cody, all of these seals witness to the verdicts for every single person that's ever lived. In a way, it's like a confirmed notary saying that within this book, the contents of this will in Testament, everything that they're saying is true, and I testify here officially to say that, yes, that is true. Absolutely. So, in other words, because I've, I've heard a few people say that, yes, it's the, book, it's the book of destiny, as Mrs. White says, but the seals are still the churches. Well, they can't be because then they wouldn't be related to the scroll in which they are sealed. So it has, the seals have to be related. So the seals are witnesses, in other words. Absolutely. It's exactly what they are. So the very statement of Ellen White the very chapter in which we are introduced to the book of destiny in Revelation chapter 5, both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy testify to the fact that our understanding of the seals is wrong. As Seventh-day Adventists in the book Daniel and Revelation, great book, but not perfect. Right. It's not a correct understanding of the seals, Cody, and we need to come to grips with that. Same with the error with the King of the North. The King of the North and Uriah Smith's work, while it is very much wholesome and, you know, encourage people to check it out, uh, sure. But um, is it 100% accurate? No. Don't, don't accept anything, not from us, not from Uriah Smith. Things aren't sanctified by time, and, and that's something that the Catholic Church that's something that they do, and we don't want to be like them. And that's one of the points you brought up last time was that how are we any different from this power that is, is the enemy of Christ and that is, is pointed out by God as the enemy church in the world, the enemy in the world against the entire world, against his church and against Christ himself. How are we any different from them if we're going to take their same their same methodology of how they create doctrines and apply it to ourselves. We can't trust our church fathers per se either, and we shouldn't. We should accept absolutely nothing that we can't see ourselves in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that we accept things in authoritative manner from Ellen White is because we've proven her through the scriptures as a prophet. 
And, and and so those are the those are the pillars on which we stand. And unfortunately, people like Uriah Smith, while they are very very smart, probably much smarter than me, um, and James White and these other individuals, they're just men. Uh, they're, they're, they weren't prophets, and they had errors. Errors that we can provably see today with Uriah Smith in particular, with the King of the North, which we know to be the papacy, mm -hmm. and this other issue here with the seals. Mm -hmm. There's four seals. First four, all horses. The other, the last three seals, different. There's souls under the altar, people that were killed for their belief in God's word. Then you have the scenes in nature, the falling of the stars, the, the sun turning black as sackcloth. And then you have uh, the seventh seal when there's silence in heaven. But the first four look at different horses. There's four horses, a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. It's absolutely critical that we study the Bible to find out what this symbol represents. It's, I mean, we've been doing that all through our study of Daniel and Revelation. We see a symbol, we say, okay, what does the Bible say that symbol means? We go through the Bible to find out what it means. We did it in Daniel 7 when we saw those four beasts. Of course, we were fortunate because Daniel, we didn't have to go very far to find out what a beast was because in verse 17 of Daniel 7, it said the four beasts are four kings or kingdoms right. on the earth. So that was real simple. Now, when we've come to the book of Revelation, we saw the candlesticks in Revelation chapter 1. What do those candlesticks represent? We went back to the Old Testament. We went back to the sanctuary in the holy place on the left side. And we said the candlesticks were in the holy place of the sanctuary on earth. So we concluded John was looking at Christ in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. We saw another symbol in Revelation chapter 2. We saw the symbol of Balaam in the church of Pergamos. And we, so we went back and we saw what Balaam represented. He was the epitome of compromise. And that's what Pergamos was all about. The precursor to the church of the dark ages. It was pure compromise. We came to the next church, Thyatira, and the symbol that represented Thyatira was Jezebel. So what did we do? We went back to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That's all that was in existence in John's time. We went back, we studied, we found out all the characteristics of Jezebel. And then we knew who was plaguing the church at that time period in earth's history. So with every symbol that we have seen in the book of Revelation thus far, we did it last time when we were looking at the four living creatures right. in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. We said, well, let's see if there's any place in the Old Testament where those creatures are talked about. Well, we went to Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. We went to Isaiah chapter 6. We found that they were cherubim. So all we've tried to do here, Cody, is we've tried to take a symbol from the Bible, search it through Scripture, see what the Bible says that symbol means, and then how does it relate to the picture that John is painting in that chapter. That's all we've done. And that's what we're going to do with the horses. So we come to verse 1. Uh, the Bible says, I saw when the Lamb, of course, we saw that only Jesus 
because he won back the human race by his death and resurrection that only he had the right to open the seals so that the contents of the book of destiny would be revealed. So here is Jesus opening one of the seals. I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four cherubim, the living creatures saying, come and see. Now it's interesting, with each one of the horses, the, the command is, come and see. Yes. The interesting thing is, the Greek word there is erku. And erku is just like the Hawaiian word aloha. When somebody arrives on the, in the islands of Hawaii, the people say aloha meaning welcome. When a person leaves the islands of Hawaii, the people say aloha, meaning farewell. Aloha means welcome, and it means farewell. Two opposites, two opposite meanings to the word aloha. Erku in the Greek is the exact same thing. It can mean come, but it can also mean go, go, go. Okay? Verse 2. I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. In order to rightly look at all four of these first four seals <coughs> we need to go to the Old Testament and find out when the usage of the word horse was used in a symbolic manner to then say okay this is what it means symbolically and that of course is how John is using it here in a symbolic way so let's go to the Old Testament and see if there ever was any time in the Old Testament scriptures where a horse was used symbolically. First off, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. The story is of Elijah mm -hmm. and Elisha. Verse 9. It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. It came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now was that a literal horse that flew from the earth up into the heavens? Is that, was that a literal horse that eats apples and, and straw? No. Clearly, we have a symbol here. We have a, a horse and a chariot of fire that took Elijah from this earth into heaven. Now, if you go back and read Ellen White's comments on this passage she says that angels of God took Elijah up into heaven so we have one example right here in 2nd Kings 2 verses 9 through 11 where horses and chariots of fire I mean that's a unit a horse and a chariot of fire took Elijah to heaven. It was, an, it was angels. Let's take another example. 
2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Start with verse 15. This is the story of Elisha and Ben-Hadad. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he, Elisha, answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now in verse 15, before we read verse 17, the horses and chariots in verse 15, is that being used literally or symbolically? Were those literal horses and chariots that Ben-Hadad sent to surround the city of Dothan? Of course they were. Verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So Ben-Hadad's horses and chariots surrounded the city of Dothan and Ben and Elisha's servant was alarmed and Elisha said don't worry there are more with us than with them and the Lord opened the eyes of Elisha's servant and he saw horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha so the question I would ask is, what were those horses and chariots of fire that encircled Elisha that would keep them safe from Ben-Hadad's literal horses and chariots? What were they? Angel armies. Angel armies, Cody. You know, if you go back, you read Ellen White's comments from prophets and kings clearly she says that those horses and chariots of fire were angels so we have two references 2 Kings 2 2 Kings chapter 6 where horses are symbolically representing angels now my question before we look at four, at least three or four others, what do angels have to do specifically with people's destinies? How are angels a part of that equation? What involvement do they have in people determining their destiny? Now that's a thought. We'll have to look at that in deeper detail here soon. Another passage, Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were their red horses, speckled and white. So Zechariah saw different colored horses, red horses, speckled horses, white horses. And then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? 
The angel that talked with me said to me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So the horses represent those whom the Lord sends to walk to and fro through the earth. The obvious question is, who does the Lord send to walk to and fro through the earth? He sends angels, angel messengers. Even the devil himself answered the Lord by saying that that's what he does as well. Absolutely. So with this spiritual battle going on, they would all be walking amongst the earth to and fro, everywhere. Absolutely. They could be in Asia one day and in Canada the next day, depending on where their labors take them, fighting this spiritual battle that's taking place. Absolutely. Very interesting. Absolutely. We now have three clear references in the Bible that horses represent angels. And again, I ask the question, what do angels have to do with the destiny of mankind? Because again, the seals all witness to what's in that book of destiny. So each one of these seals say all of the decisions in the book of destiny are absolutely correct. What do angels have to do with the destiny of every human being? They certainly have something to do with it. Well, I mean, just in a... Uh uh, I, know, I don't know if you, you're going there right now or not, but just, just what comes to my mind immediately is the angels that were woven into the veils of the cloth and, and put on the walls inside the sanctuary. So they're involved in the atonement process. They're involved in redemption, the plan of redemption. They're all there. There's covering cherub. They're all there, part of that uh, story and and each and every person we and we know if we study Ellen White that she talks about a recorder angel being around us all the time Hebrew says are they not all ministering spirits that's what they do they, they're ministers they're ministering to people and they're fighting this spiritual battle to and fro throughout the earth but the thing that came to my mind immediately what role do they have well they're right there in the sanctuary which is in the heart of God's work and we know that there are angels uh, surrounding his throne, looking at the work that God is doing there on his throne, whether it's the judgment um, or whatever he's doing. I mean, we haven't quite crossed all these bridges yet, but they're all a part, they're all very intensely interested in the things that are going on here in this earth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Zechariah chapter 6. Here's another reference. Verse 2, Zechariah chapter 6. In the first chariot were red horses. In the second chariot, black horses. In the third chariot, white horses. And in the fourth chariot, gristled and bay horses. While not in the same order, it sounds basically identical to the same horses that we see in Revelation 6. Right. Same colors. I answered and said to the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? The angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. So we have four, these horses, 
They stand before the Lord of all the earth and they go forth from heaven to earth. Now that word spirits is interesting because Psalms 104 makes very clear what those spirits are who the Lord uses in the plan of redemption. Psalms 104 verse 4 it says, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Zechariah 6 says these are four spirits sent from standing before the Lord. David says the spirits are angels standing before the Lord whom the Lord sends into all the earth. Now we have four Old Testament passages that make it very clear that horses, when used symbolically, represent angels. Another passage, Zechariah chapter 10, verse 3. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 3. What is represented there as the Lord's goodly horse? Who is it? It's not an angel. No, it's, uh, it's his flock. It's his flock or his people. Right. So let's put together what we have so far. We have the book of destiny that goes from Adam to the end of time. Around it are seals, the first four of which are represented by horses. And those seals testify to all the decisions in the book of destiny. We have seen now that the first four that are identified as different colored horses represent angels in four places and God's people in one place. So my question would be, based on all that we've seen so far, what do angels and God's children do together that affects the destiny of people in that book of destiny? What do they do? How is there a relationship between angels and God's people and the destiny of every human being? Evangelism. That's exactly right. Angels and people unite together to give messages. And by how people respond to those messages, they determine their destiny. Now, what are the colors? White, red, black, and pale. In that order. Messages. Can you think of a message, a message white? What does white represent in scripture? Righteousness. Righteousness. And because Jesus is the only one righteous, then the white horse is the message 
of righteousness that comes by faith. And that is the message that God has been sending for how long? Since the beginning. Since the very beginning of time. If you remember, in Genesis chapter 3, did God send the message of righteousness by faith to Adam and Eve? Did he? Well, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What was that a message of? That was the message of the coming of the Messiah. And that the Messiah would put within the reach of fallen, sinful humanity his righteousness. And friends, that message that righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ was given in Eden. It was given to Cain and Abel. You remember in the story in Genesis chapter 4, what do we see happening immediately in the story of Cain and Abel? They were offering sacrifice. What did that represent? It represented the fact that they were looking by faith for the Redeemer to come. That was the message of righteousness by faith that God preached to Cain and Abel. Of course, Abel's offering was accepted because he embraced it. Cain didn't. And so then God had to send him more messages. Right. You see? You see I mean, you see it again when they're first kicked out. Uh, for instance, in verse 21, uh, when they made themselves the fig leaves. <laughs> And then God makes, he says, no, the fig leaves, your works are not going to be good enough. The fig leaves that you've made, they're not good enough. They're not going to cover your sin. So God, in verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. So the Lord provided the, the covering for them. And that was very symbolic of the, uh, them trying to cover their own sins, which is pretty much exactly what they did, tried to do. Um, and the Lord stepping in and saying, no, if, if you're sorry for your sins, the only way to have them covered is through me. The only way to righteousness is by faith. Absolutely. Very interesting message. <laughs> and it's right there in the beginning. Right after sin, it's right there. Absolutely, Cody. You look at, Cody, when you come to Noah and the antediluvians, you say, well, well, Noah's message was get in the ark and be saved. Yeah, but there was more to Noah's message. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of what? Of the righteousness. righteousness by faith. Which is by faith. Which is by faith. And that's why Jesus even said uh, that individuals like Abraham looked to the future to my day and rejoiced. So that's, I mean, that's, it's, that's amazing because it's, it's been there from the beginning. We've lost it. We lost that message as a church. Um, and, and we've lost it even in the Seventh-day Adventist church where it was renewed. We, now in today's Seventh-day Adventist, we've lost it again. But it's never changed. That's always been the message that God has had for his people. God always sends. And the, the, the first and I'm going to say it this way. The first angel's message 
that God has been sending from the beginning of earth's history is the message of righteousness by faith. From the very beginning all the way down to the close of time. And in our time, God has given a special, a special message, a first angel's message that highlights that righteousness comes by faith. It's a revitalization of that timeless message, which is why the first angel's message begins with by saying it's the everlasting gospel, because that's what it is. It's exactly right. It's eternal. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely. I think what I'll do is go through the horses and the colors, and then we'll come back and pick up the rest of it in a next, a next meeting. Yeah, that's fine. Okay? So we have the white horse, the message of righteousness by faith that testifies to the decisions in the Book of Destiny and by how people respond to that message through all time, they are determining their destiny to be with God forever or to be separated from him forever. And you know, I just want to say one thing at this point. How we've traditionally uh, translated this or interpreted this as a church would say that this is from 31 AD to 100 AD. And all things considered with the horses, the angels, the righteousness by faith message and the witness of that, it's a it's a sort of a proof positive that this is not that time period because Ephesus was not a perfect church. Smyrna, maybe you could give it that title. Um, Philadelphia, maybe you could give it that title sure, sure because there was no rebuke there. Sure but could. Ephesus did have a rebuke. So Ephesus can't be pure white. They would have, been, they, they would have had spots on them. They would have been spotted. They would, there would have been something some stain somewhere because they just weren't a perfect church. That's a very excellent point. If, if we try to compare and, and say these are representing the same thing, the white horse is purity. And Ephesus wasn't pure. Just wasn't. Yeah. Now you come to the, the red horse and we'll go back, like I said, next time we'll look at the, you know, the, the first rider having a bow, crown was given to him, conquering to conquer. We'll okay. look at that next time. Okay. The red horse, what does red represent in the Bible? Well, the cardinal passage, and we could find many passages. I'm going to read one. Isaiah chapter 1. Verses 18 and 19. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What's red? like crimson? Sin is red like crimson, the Bible says. The red horse, after God has sent the message of righteousness by faith, and for the most people in this earth's history, they've rejected that message. Does God give up on people? No. God tries again with another message. This time he says, you've fallen into sin. You're living in sin. You've rejected my righteousness. Repent, turn around, and accept my righteousness. 
So the second angel's message that God sends is the red horse that says, fallen into sin, I'm warning you, repent before it's too late. That message has been given since the beginning of time. It was given to Cain in the Garden of Eden, you know, just outside the gates of Eden. Notice Genesis chapter 4. What did God say after Cain rejected the sacrifice of Christ, the righteousness of Jesus? What did God say to Cain? Notice verse 5. It says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well... Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. What was the second message that God sent to Cain? Cain, you've rejected my righteousness. You've fallen into sin. You must repent. You must turn around and embrace my righteousness. I'm warning you, Cain, a second angel's message, a message of warning, fallen into sin, repent. I actually have one I want to add to that, too. Go ahead. I, just back in, in Noah's day again, but spoken of in Jude. Okay. In Jude, verse uh, 14 and 15 talks about the special message that Enoch had. And it says, uh, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So a message of repent, God's judgment is coming. And actually, he was pointing to the second coming too, which is very interesting because the first coming hadn't happened yet. But he was pointing to the judgment work, Enoch, back in the days of the flood. Same message. Same message. Same message. What I find so incredibly beautiful there's so many different fronts. But what is so beautiful to me is we're looking at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We saw through the churches how Christ sought to, to save his, his church throughout the Christian era. But now we've expanded it. And now the question is, well, how, does, how has Christ Throughout all history, how has he sought to be fair to every child of humanity? How has he tried to save mankind? And from the beginning of earth's history, he has sent three messages. Here is my righteousness. If that is rejected, he sends a second angel's message fallen into sin, repent, turn around. When that message is rejected, God sends another message, a final, if you will, a third angel's message that's been sounding from the beginning of earth's history. And that message is, I've given you two, two messages. You've rejected both of them. I'm giving you one more. But this time, it's going to come with the threat that your probation's almost over. Mm. 
You see, time is now running out because the hardness of the person's heart, it's becoming hardened against God. And so God sends this fearful warning judgment message. If you don't accept it now, you will suffer my wrath. So we come to the black horse. It's fascinating to me, and I'll just mention it briefly. The rider on the black horse has a pair of balances in his hand. And a pair of balances was how you would weigh things. Mm. Now they did that, of course, materially, economically, but in a spiritual sense. Yeah. The balances, Belshazzar. Um, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. Thou hast been weighed in the balances and been found wanting. Those balances represented judgment, final warning. Right. If you really measured up or not. If you measured up, you're accepted. Yeah. If you don't, it's over. For Belshazzar, it was over. It was over. Now, what does black represent in Scripture? Well, I will only mention one passage, and that has to do with the ninth plague in Egypt. Of course, the tenth plague was the slaying of the firstborn. What was the ninth plague in Egypt? It was the final warning. I'm about to slay your firstborn sons. What was the precursor to the slaying of the firstborn son? It's found in Exodus chapter 10, verse 21 and 22. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. The darkness was so thick, you could feel it. There was blackness. So thick, you couldn't see anything. It was so black. What did that represent? In the context of the ten plagues, that darkness or blackness was a final warning. This is it. You either get it right, or you're going to see your firstborn son dead in the morning. That final plague, that ninth plague, was that final warning to the Egyptians to repent and to embrace the God of Moses. The black horse is a final warning message. Been sounding from the days of Adam and Eve all the way down to now. And in a special sense, the third angel's message today, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Perfect continuity throughout the scriptures and throughout time. These messages are literally timeless and they show the revelation of the character of Christ 
that in that book of destiny, he has been so fair because he has given every person who has ever lived opportunities through these messages of mercy, of mercy and warning, of mercy and final warning. So you see through all time how fair and how just Christ has been. And each of those messages wrapped around the book of destiny declare, they declare that the decisions in the book of destiny have been absolutely fair because God tried to reach every person through these messages. So in a nutshell, before, before you go on to the last horse here, in a nutshell, these horses represent a combined um, co-laboring of angels and God's people throughout all time with these specific messages on righteousness by faith, repent, you've fallen into sin, and up to this point, judgment. All those messages have been given since the beginning, Absolutely. and they will be given until the very end, and they are our messages for today. And these, these messages and the work that they've done throughout time stand as witnesses on the book of destiny Absolutely. to testify that God is righteous and true and good and he gave these people multiple chances I'm sure we'll see so many chances each person um, but they are they are seals but they're witnesses of of his goodness and that that's exactly Cody in in Roman law in the first century that's exactly what seals were around a person's will. Each seal testified, witnessed that what was in that document was absolutely correct and true. See, they testify. So the so and especially for, for John's day. So in John's day, this is something that would have been understood by the Gentiles who would have received these messages. They would say, oh, these are witnesses. These seals are witnesses because that's what they are in, in real life. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's amazing. So it's, a, it's, it's something that was uh, uh, practical that could, they could see in real life, but also symbolic that they could prophetically see God was doing the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll get to the pennies, the three measures of barley, three right, measures, yeah. the, the penny for wheat. That, that's thrilling. It makes perfect sense. We'll get to it next time. The fourth horse, it's a pale horse. And what is his name? Death and hell. You have three messages. If we respond to them, we embrace Christ. He becomes our Savior. We, are, we enter heaven. If we reject those messages and we reject every effort of God to save us from our sins, what will be the result? The result is death and hell. And so God, through all time, in varying circumstances, through varying circumstances, sending messages, I love you, I want to save you, come to me. You've fallen, you, you've rejected my grace, please come back to me. You're still not listening. I'm giving you one more shot. Your heart's becoming hardened, your mind is becoming perverse against the principles of heaven. I'm going to give you one last chance. Please turn around before it's forever too late. He exhausts every effort to save mankind and then he lets people go to their decision. 
And their decision is death. Their decision is hell. They've chosen to be eternally separated from God. Not eternally tormented. No. But no. eternal death. Their death will be for all time. It, there, there's no second chance. It's irrevocable after this, after this decision is made. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because in the, in the seals themselves... After those first four horses, there's no more messages. There's other means in the fifth and sixth seals as to how God tries to save mankind. But there's no more messages. There's no more horses. In other words, those last few messages are, 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 are more so um, witnesses that are testifying that these four messages were accurate. And that they didn't, they didn't accept these, and this is what happened, the voices of the martyrs. This is what they're so dead set on, on going to death, going to hell, that they have another witness against them to testify that, yes, the decisions made in the Book of Destiny are righteous and true. And just another witness. So that's what those other witnesses would be. Mm -hmm. That's amazing because we're not taught. We're taught some very loose, hard, confusing, hard to understand, confusing sort of, uh, you know, oh, Constantine and Emperor Justinian working together with the black horse to, and it, it, it never really made sense to me. And, and now that I'm hearing, hearing this, this makes perfect sense because it's timeless. These messages, the first, second, and third angel's message, there's, there's, no, diff there's no different standard for any people that have ever lived on earth. I don't know why we get that in our heads, that there was a different standard, but there wasn't. There it's wasn't. It's always been the same. It's always been the same. Righteousness by faith. You've sinned. Repent. Judgment is coming. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, eternal death. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. thanks be to God, the gift of God through Jesus Christ is eternal life. Amen. Cool. And he could make us righteous if we just accept that by faith. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of people have said over the years, they've said, oh, well, is, are you saying that's new light? Um, the Bible is, is, is light. The Bible is true. And any time, and I would encourage, I would strongly encourage all of our listeners, go back and look at all that we've looked at today. Look at the Bible passages. Look at the Spirit of Prophecy quotes. Does that, if something is, is different light or new light, it never contradicts what we know to be true. And what we've shared here today only makes more beautiful in my mind the messages God has given to us to share with the world today. Right. Because what these messages that God has been giving through all time, right. he's showing us by how people respond to those messages, they are determining their destiny. Well, that, that means that as we share the three angels' messages with this world today, by how people respond, they're determining their destiny. It shows how important, how absolutely important the mission that God has called us to do is. So I see nothing in what we've looked at here today that contradicts in any way, shape, or form the truths that we can clearly lay out in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. doesn't at all. It only makes them more beautiful. Um, so I would encourage everybody to go back, study the verses, look up, you know, Ellen White's comments on the, the horses in uh, Elijah's translation. Yeah, prophet and king, Prophets and Kings has, talks okay. about that, yes. Exactly. Go back and look at that. And none of what we've shared here contradicts in any way, shape, or form 
fundamental Bible spirit of prophecy, Seventh-day Adventist truth. It certainly contradicts uh, Seventh-day Adventist traditions yes. that has no basis in the Bible, or Ellen White, for that matter. It most surely does that. We just want truth here, and I believe you do too. Absolutely, and, and, and if I might add on to that, just to say the individuals who, who we encourage and challenge to, to, to take a look at those verses, do that. And then you know, also go go ahead and take a look. To go ahead and take a look at what Uriah Smith, and what, and what James White, and what some of these other uh, some of these other uh, pioneers, and all due respect to them, complete all due respect to them. Absolutely. But look at what they say, and tell me how many Bible Bible uh, quotes they give to support what they're saying. How many spirit of prophecy quotes they give to support what they're saying? They don't give many. They just talk this through and, and kind of work it out in their own mind, and then there you go. Well, that's, that's nice, but there are lots of smart individuals out in the world that could come to a lot of different conclusions with very interesting uh, tidbits as well. So again, we don't have any doctrines in this church that are sanctified by time only. Amen, Cody. And better I think, not. <laughs> right, we, I think it's another testament as well that... Seventh-day Adventism is that special high calling that God is calling the world into today because we see the same messages over and over again. We saw the messages in Daniel chapter 8 that talked about something that happened in 1844. What was that? It was the judgment. Who has that message? Who has the sanctuary message? It's the Seventh-day Adventists that have that. We Amen. saw it again in Daniel chapter 12 where it talked about 1843 and what happened there. Well, that was, right, that was right around that time with the great disappointment. And blessed are those that, that reached that, that accepted that message yeah. and went forth. Again, Seventh-day Adventism. Again, the message. The three angels' messages that we have, which we're going to get to in, 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 as we go through. But then again here, we saw it in the seven churches. Again, the Church of Philadelphia, then, then into the Church of Laodicea, yeah. and what they needed. And again, we're seeing it here. And we're, we're, I just love the continuity that I see because n now for the first time, those seals makes sense. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the beautiful message. The beautiful message. Amen. So you have anything else you want to add? Or? I'm good. All right. We'll take a look at the rest of those seals and witnesses next time. Yes, sir. Will you close us out in prayer, please? Sure. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Uh, help us to only accept what we can see in the Bible and in the corresponding statements from Ellen White. Yes. Uh, bless us, strengthen us, light a fire. Light a fire in our minds and hearts that we would personalize what we have studied here today to realize how dreadfully important the three angels' messages are. Yes. And how that by how people respond, they determine their destiny. Strengthen us, Lord, to share these messages to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.